everyone. Thank you so much for joining our second session of the Career Roundtable today. My name is Marcy Bishop Lilly. I'm the career coach for CVAT and the College of Music. And today we have two special guests with us. Um, we have Peter Hyland, who is the director of the Onset Institute. And we also have assistant professor of art education, Kathy Brown. We do have an agenda. Um, I will be introducing our presenters. Um, we have Peter and Kathy, and I also want to go over our calendar of uh, sessions with guest faculty. So Peter, um, he's going to talk a little bit about arts administration and the career pathways um, within that area. And we also have Kathy Brown, who will uh, be talking a little bit about art education certification and the education job market. I also have a recommendation for podcasts uh, for this session. Uh, and you can find these podcasts on Glass Tire. I would highly recommend any artist, any student look at this website. They post jobs, internships, uh, grants, exhibition opportunities. And they also have a pretty good amount of news um, and exhibition openings around the DFW area. But something that is really unique about this is that they do have a good selection of podcasts. Uh, and for this session, I thought this one was really interesting. Uh, virtual reality, is this the future of art? Um, and I've seen a lot of uh, augmented reality kind of um, works coming about. And so uh, it's just something to think about. So if you're looking for a podcast, something to listen to, um, I would definitely recommend that. And it is hyperlinked. So if you're looking at this presentation, you can click on that. Um, link and it will send you right over there. So this is our session calendar. Our first session it was just me and Banat in that one. Um, and we kind of talked a little bit about the pandemic and the art industry and what you can do right now uh, to market yourself and to get the skills that you need under your belt to prepare you for um, the workforce after graduation. Uh, so we'll have Peter Hyland and Kathy Brown in this session, and then our next session in November, um, we'll have Troy Abel and we'll also have Nathan McCown. And Troy is actually a professor of user experience uh, and user experience design. So he's going to talk a little bit about the industry in that area. We'll also have Nathan, who is recruiting students um, for various positions in user experience design. And I'll also go over a little bit about the Main Green Mentor Program, which is uh, a career center program aimed to pair students with their designated faculty or areas. Um, and we will also have some employers who will be or who will be serving as mentors to some of our students as well. So I'll go over some information on that. Uh, in our fourth and final session of the semester, we'll have Connie Hatchett and Laura Evans. Connie is uh, the Kimball Art Museum Education Manager, so she's going to talk a little bit about uh, the atmosphere of working in a museum, the career pathways of that, uh, and Laura Evans will be talking more about art education uh, and also art crimes. She's a certified art crime specialist, which is really cool. I didn't really know uh, you know, that that existed. So, well, that's going to be really interesting to talk about. Uh, and then I'll also mention the Main Green Mentor Program again, just as a reminder that that's a, an up and running program. And I'll also have another podcast of the month. Uh, and so, um, if, you know, students, if you have any questions, uh, you will be sent a short survey at the end of the session just to see how we can improve. Um, we hope that these sessions continue to grow and we can have more faculty and more employers come in these sessions and talk to you guys. So we'd really like to know your feedback on that. But um, we'll go ahead and get started with our guest speakers. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand over uh, the screen to Peter. So, um, Peter, if you want to share your screen, we'll go ahead and get started, okay? All right. There we go. Is everybody seeing that okay? Yep. 
Yes. All right, great. Well, Marcy, thanks for having us uh, here today. This is uh, really, I've been looking forward to it. Uh, I remember being a student and figuring out or trying to figure out what I was going to be doing with myself eventually and um, not having a lot of good ideas. So I think um, programs like this are really valuable. And so thank you guys for, for having them. Um, my name's Peter Hyland again. Um, I'm director of the Onsted Institute for Education in the Visual Arts and Design. And um, I've been uh, in that role um, since 2015. And uh, so I'm the inaugural director. Um, we've you know, just been around for about five years now. Our mission is, uh, as you can see on the slide here, really it's to, to be short and sweet, it's to provide programs and resources for uh, K through 12 constituencies, populations. And so that can look a lot of different ways. It can look like traditional professional development for arts educators, um, can look like student workshops for um, K through 12 students in art making. Um, it can look like supporting our own students here in CVAD through um, funding for travel for professional uh, conferences and um, helping to fund uh, projects for faculty. And so the Institute has really this wide array of um, capability and content. And we really serve the whole college, uh, even though we're aligned, of course, really well with art education. Um, we do work with every department within the college uh, to collaborate um, both on internal projects and projects that are external. So what I thought I would do is um, uh, look at career opportunities in arts administration um, through a particular sort of lens, which uh, I thought it might be helpful to sort of tell you about what my experience was as a student, how I started out and where I wound up, um, how I wound up in this role ultimately. So um, this is gonna be a little bit of a, a autobiographical odyssey of, <laughs> of my career choices, but hopefully it'll give you a good sense of what choices there are available within arts administration. Um, you know, first off, I'll give a little bit of an oversight of or overview of some of the things that fall under the helm of arts administration. Um, fundraising is a big aspect of it. If you see the terms development and advancement, those are typically referring to, uh, in large part, fundraising activities. Advancement um, usually will um, include things like marketing as well, which you also see further down on uh, the list here. And so, um, of course, you know, many arts organizations are nonprofits. Fundraising is sort of the backbone of the way that they are able to function. And so um, it's a big part of the way that arts administration um, uh, is configured. Um, looking at budgets, um, creating them, managing them, overseeing them, making sure you're not going over budget. Um, all of that sort of thing is really part and parcel of arts administration. Event planning in a lot of different ways. So this can link up with programmatic things like um, listed in the bullet point below that. Um, they can be fundraising events, uh, so gala events to help raise funds for your organization. Uh, they might be um, cultivation events to cultivate a certain membership group in your organization. So these can be very small events or these can be very big events. But in one way or another, um, arts administration uh, tackles that side of things as well. And then again, programmatic content, that's sort of your bread and butter, what you're offering to the community um, through the content provided by your organization. Uh, marketing and PR, um, also included under arts administration. And then things like strategic planning. So uh, if you're in leadership roles, uh, looking at what uh, your organization, how it's um, behaved historically and what the vision for the future <clears throat> may be. Um, and working with your, your colleagues and as well as with the population you serve to identify the needs that are most relevant uh, so that you're able to um, uh, you know, take care of those uh, as the organization grows uh, from year to year. So these are just some of the sort of the big 
ticket items that are included under arts administration. Um, so, but I'm gonna jump back to sort of how I got going within the arts and leading up to my career in arts and administration. So uh, once upon a time, there was this thing called analog video editing, which now you can do most of this stuff just on your phone. But uh, at a certain point in time, you needed to have a bunch of big equipment and a big room to put it in uh, to be able to uh, manipulate your video content. And so my father uh, was a video editor. I grew up in um, video editing environments. Um, and so this was really my first introduction to visual culture. Um, and, uh, you know, I was fortunate in that he worked on a lot of different sorts of things. But I grew up in an environment where that was dealing with um, notions of, of, of visual content um, was a part of my upbringing. And so um, even though I was not, can't say that I was really an artsy kid, um, by the time I got to being a teenager, I'd had you know, all of this um, experience with visual culture through video editing. And so around the time when I was 15, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, take on an internship position at a computer animation company. And uh, I had a vocational program through my high school that allowed me to leave in the afternoons and work into the evenings and do that every day. And so I took on this job. I started as an intern, um, eventually became a colorist for um, this company called Solid Ideas. Um, we use programs like this, uh, Animator Pro, which again, if you look at the interface, is it looks ancient um, compared to what is used now. But this was um, at the forefront of uh, software that people were using at the time. And so um, learned how to use that, learned how to use uh, uh, 3D Studio. These days, this is called 3D Studio Max. Again, the interface looks completely different now. But I, I worked uh, from 15 to 18 at this company doing this. Um, and this was really my introduction to time management. Um, I had deadlines, they, they were real deadlines. I had to uh, be able to get all of the work done within the time frame uh, and go to school and do all that at the same time. So this is where I really learned how to project manage and um, begin to learn how to do that, I should say. Um, I wasn't a pro by the end of it, but. Uh, get a sense of what it means to be in a role where you have to have a deadline and adhere to a deadline. Um, also dealing with clients. This was um, a way in which uh, I began to understand what it was to uh, understand a client's perspective, um, translate what they were looking for into a final product, um, all the sorts of things that um, you, know, you uh, wind up learning in like our comp design program, for example. Um, those are things that I started learning uh, through this vocational program. Um, and so I did that till I was 18. I realized at a certain point that I really wasn't, even though I enjoyed the experience, I didn't want to be doing computer animation for uh, my career. And so I thought, okay, well, what, what can I do? Um, and so I worked at Sears because <laughs> I couldn't figure out exactly what I wanted. But um, you know, I'm mentioning this because you'll have jobs sometimes that are clarifying events for you. And so this was one of those. Um, I realized that I did not want to work retail um, for the rest of my life. It wasn't uh, something that I was into or passionate about. Um, it made me sort of understand those things about my experience at the animation company that I really did appreciate, that I wanted to um, pursue further. And so I started thinking about what what the next step for me could be uh, in this vein. And eventually I decided, okay, well, it might make sense to go to college and study visual arts. And so I wound up getting my BFA from CVAD, uh, just like you guys are. And uh, uh, in drawing and painting, um, I really appreciated my experience at UNT because I sort of got a spectrum of artistic approaches from a everything from sort of a classical um, approach to painting to things that were much more in the contemporary and um, sort of avant-garde um, vein of things. 
um, the program just exposed me to a great variety of ways of making, which has been important to the rest of my career because basically it gave me the tools that I needed not only to make artworks, to physically make them, but also to think through problems and solve problems um, and utilize strategies that artists use um, in that way. And so I'll talk about some of that as uh, I continue along uh, uh, with um, my presentation here. And so I got uh, my BFA uh, at the same time I was getting into writing, uh, creative writing, and I was getting pulled a little bit more in that direction when I graduated. So I decided I wanted to go into graduate school, but I didn't want to go for visual arts. I wanted to go for creative writing. And so I wound up going to uh, the University of Houston, getting my MFA in creative writing poetry, and, um, and then eventually publishing the uh, first book. Uh, here's the, the cover. I was able to get this really nice Magritte that I wanted. I uh, was super stoked about that. Um, but uh, so again, I had this other divergence where I went down this other road, um, but learning to write in this way. Um, you know, I learned attention to detail in particular ways, um, learning how to communicate um, complicated ideas to audiences that might not be well versed in them um, was something that I learned through this experience as well. Um, and so, you know, I, up until this point, I've had this sort of motley background and I remember graduating um, with my MFA and thinking, okay, well, well, I was getting ready to graduate and I was thinking, well, what can I do with all of these very peculiar things that I have amassed for myself and not really knowing uh, which direction I'd like to go. But I was fortunate that my last year of graduate school, I had a friend who was working at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston um, in the development department, so doing fundraising. Um, and they had a writing position that was opening up and they were looking for somebody who could write and who knew how to write about art. And so um, I threw my hat in the ring for that position and, uh, and got it. And so what ultimately I, I, I did in that role was really any sort of com uh, communication, that, written communication that came out of the development department I had my hands on in one way or another. So that included acknowledgement letters, which are thank you letters from organizational leadership to donors to thank them for, uh, for helping to fund the institution. Um, annual fund appeals, if uh, you, know, you look in your mailbox and you get, uh, you know, hey, please donate um, you know, $50 this month toward our organization. That was the sort of thing that um, I helped to write um, with uh, the annual fund manager. Um, exhibition descriptions, so basically taking uh, curatorial language and putting it into language for a more general audience uh, was a lot of, of what I did in that role as well. Um, and so in the, to be able to do that, my experience as a visual artist uh, coming out of CVAD was really crucial. Um, I would not have been able to uh, sort of create these descriptions without having had that experience um, coming through a program like CVAD. So um, that was where I started to see things beginning to link up in terms of my career experience um, and my current role. Uh, grant proposals, um, um, wrote those two. Uh, that wasn't as primary a part of my job as it would become later on, but that's where I began to understand what it is to write a proposal, um, both for an organization, but individually for yourself as well. A lot of you guys are going to be applying for, um, uh, you know, fellowship opportunities, artist and res residence opportunities, those sorts of things. The same principles that an organization use, uses to write grant proposals, those are the same principles that um, you would use to write uh, proposals for individual endeavors as well. Um, fundraising campaign materials, so um, helping to create materials surrounding big sort of, uh, for example, capital projects. If there's a building that's being built um, to fundraise around that, there's a lot of uh, collateral materials that are developed to explain why it's important to have the building, 
what's going to go in it, how people can become engaged with, um, with the endeavor, that sort of thing. And then things like members, magazines, um, you know, any, any, any sort of, you know, articles for that, um, any sort of writing this position had its hands on within the organization. Now, one thing I'll mention is that because of that, I got to work with um, folks at, in different positions um, throughout the whole organization. So I was working with curators. I was working with the, the director of the museum. I was working with um, uh, managers within the development department and um, advancement. And it really uh, gave me the opportunity to understand the roles of um, that are present within an organization, what it takes to, you know, what you have to have in place to make a, a organization run successfully, and then how best to communicate with your colleagues to, um, you know, uh, achieve a common purpose. So from there, I went on to Houston Grand Opera, and I essentially did the same thing. The, um, but all of my, you know, I had no uh, grounding in opera. Um, again, uh, as you can see, my, uh, my sort of uh, pedigree came from the, the visual arts, but all of, everything I learned in the visual arts applied to my role at the opera. Um, you know, uh, one, in being able to understand the art form itself, um, and then two, in being able to articulate the dimensions of that art form to others. Um, you know, all of that goes back to what I learned as a visual artist and um, and then subsequently as a, uh, as a, a, a writer. Um, so I did that for a little bit of time. Then I went on to work for an organization called Imprint. Um, so um, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and Houston Grand Opera, large organizations, tons of people working there. Imprint, small organization, just about five people working there. Um, well, I'll say one of the benefits of working for a small organization is that you get to learn how to do everything, <laughs> even if it's not under your job description. Um, so even though I was uh, director of development and uh, primarily uh, responsible for donor solicitations, presentations to the board of directors, fundraising events, um, I also helped out with program administration. I helped out with collaborations with peer institutions. And um, that was really because the organization is so small that we had to lean on each other to do that sort of thing. Um, and so I would say that I learned a great deal from working in both environments. One, working for large organizations um, that have a large infrastructure. And then um, I learned a whole different sort of um, set of skills working for a very small organization where you had to overlap with other roles in order to get the work done. Um, eventually, I went on to work with another large organization called the Menil Collection in, in Houston, which a lot of you may know about, a uh, really fantastic museum. Um, again, here, uh, my ability to translate curatorial um, language, uh, well, one, actually, just to be fluent in curatorial language, because a lot of the people I was working with at the Menil Collection were very well-versed collectors, um, you know, individuals. Um, who could speak at a high level about art making. And so I had to be able to, to do that as well in order to engage with them and to really figure out, um, you know, why are they attracted to our institution and how can I help them uh, best engage and connect to the museum, whether that's through them making a donation or uh, connecting to programming in some way, um, all these different facets. Uh, it was my responsibility to figure out how to connect our donors to the life of the institution in the ways that are appropriate and um, exciting for them. Um, from there, I went to work for the Honors College at the University of Houston. So again, another leap to another sort of, um, uh, maybe a different set of content, but all the principles were the same uh, in terms of my ability to unpack content, my ability to um, relay and translate that content to other people, to get folks engaged and excited about an experience with an organization. Um, all of that applied to this scenario as well, even though I wasn't um, only 
funding for art making um, or writing at uh, at the college. It included all of those things because the students studied all of that stuff. Um, but I was able to expand my knowledge base into sciences and um, other uh, you know content areas as well because an honors, honors college really serves um, the whole breadth of uh, degree options. So that brings us back to the Onsted Institute. And so what do I do here? Um, so some of that looks like professional development, which I've already mentioned. We go into uh, school districts and work with school district leadership to figure out types of training that uh, would be relevant for their our teachers. And um, here, this is actually uh, right in the middle at that table, um, a former graduate student, Melody Bond, uh, who she might be adjuncting uh, right now, I'm not quite sure, but um, she was running a printmaking workshop for teachers in Fort Worth ISD. We also do things like K-12 student workshops, so creating art making opportunities for K-12 students um, from the little, little ones to um, high school students. And so uh, in doing that, we try to bring them onto uh, campus to show them what a, um, well, in the past we would have, of course, of COVID, we have different restrictions now, but um, really to expose them to what a college environment is and to what being an art maker is. Um, we put on academic things like symposia um, um, and, and work with uh, peer institutions to uh, create uh, these moments. Um, we engage in research right uh, there. The gentleman in glasses at the front of that table is Michael Gibson. He's a professor in co communication design. And so we're working with Denton ISD to um, uh, create uh, on a curriculum development and uh, research initiative surrounding design thinking as a concept. Uh, scholarship comes out of that stuff. So this is some, uh, here's just a front page of something I published with um, Professor uh, Tyson Lewis within art education. And then community events, so things uh, out and about within the community with partnering uh, organizations. So this was uh, Frisco Arts Walk um, that we had a station um, out there for art making for um, uh, really anybody, but primarily for the children who are there. So in a nutshell, that's kind of what I do, what I've done, and how I've gotten there. Um, and so, you know, not a straight line necessarily from where I began to where I am, but everything fed on each other and everything um, supported the next thing that went along. Um, but really, all of my grounding within the visual arts, uh, whether it's through video culture or through visual fine arts culture, um, as I um, learned it through CVAD, were continue to be really potent elements in my success in my career. And so hopefully that gives you just a little bit of an overview of what uh, arts administration looks like. Thanks. Great, thank you, Peter. That was really sure. awesome. All right, so Kathy, you are up next and you should be able to share your screen. All right, and Kathy, you're just as a reminder, you are on mute. I did that on purpose. Okay. Just checking everything. <laughs> technical skills. <laughs> Thank you, though. Uh, so, um, so we're here to talk about uh, K-12 art education is something that you might be considering, or something that you might consider in the future. So we'll just talk about some different uh, elements uh, in regards to art education with kids. So just a little bit of my background, and I didn't include pictures like Peter did. So now I'm thinking I should have redone it, but that's okay. So uh, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and I did all my teaching in Detroit, Michigan, except my first year I was in Ohio. And um, my pathway was maybe a little crooked, maybe a little straight at the same time, you know, kind of what Peter was talking about. Um, but I got my BA in visual art. I went to a tiny, tiny HBCU, which is, uh, stands for Historically Black College or University in Ohio. And there was two, two sister schools right across the street from one another. So you took classes at that school as well as your own school. And um, I was 
our major, which is called visual art. So you, you took a little bit of everything. And then the school across the street, my minor was graphic design. And I didn't realize I even wanted to be a teacher or even that teaching, being a certified teacher was an option for me until my senior year when I was working with children in a, uh, they would give us these little co-op positions for the summer and you have different jobs. I worked in a museum, I worked with kids, I worked uh, as a visual display merchandiser. And so working with children, it just something, it's like a light bulb, like, oh, wow, this is something I, I could really enjoy and I could see myself doing. So I got certified, I graduated, and then the next year I was certified in a post back. And I was there for a year and um, I got certified at the University of Dayton. And sometimes post bags can be um, a great option. Myself at the time, um, again, this was many moons ago, but at the time, I think there was things that I missed that I would have gotten had I done a traditional art education program, but it was still a great uh, pathway for me to enter the field. Uh, then after that, I taught for several years and then I went to get my master's at Eastern Michigan University my master's in art education. Um, I did it while I was still teaching. I just kind of took my time and did it slowly. Then I've taught for a few more years. And then uh, I left the classroom in 2014 to go back to school full-time. And I moved down here to Texas um, to attend uh, the University of Houston. And I was there full-time for four years and got my PhD in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis on art education. And in addition to, we. Our program was focused a lot on urban education, which had been most of my teaching experience in, um, in a one, wonderful city of Detroit. So Detroit is a misunderstood city. It's actually an amazing art town if you've never been there, a beautiful waterfront. But I know sometimes when you say urban, there's a, a connotation to that. But I actually taught in a many, many different types of schools uh, in the city. I taught in a private school at one point. I taught in a school of art and design, which was a public charter academy. Because uh, in Detroit, much like New Orleans and some other um, other larger, larger cities, the public school system is kind of, unfortunately, and fortunately in some ways, I guess, being being chopped down and becoming a charter system. So many of the schools in Detroit are public charter academies. So that's where I did most of my teaching. It's the same as a public school, but we weren't under the auspices of DPS, which is Detroit Public Schools. Um, but anyway, I say that because one of the schools I taught for um, was a, like I said, a school of art and design, and we were chartered by CCS, which is College for Creative Studies, which is a, a wonderful art school, if you're familiar with that. And we taught the kids the design thinking process and through the Stanford D School out of California. So that was a really interesting experience. So that's just to give you an idea what you think of as being an art teacher. There's many, many different ways to be an art teacher and there's many different types of school environments. And so I, I taught a total of 16 years, even though I look like a baby, <laughs> that's my Beyonce, I look like a baby, but I taught for 16 years. And um, then, like I said, I went back to school um, to become, to get my PhD and now I work at the wonderful UNT. So that has been my pathway. So I've kind of stayed in art education, just different, different areas of art education, different types of art education. So why even think about, why, why even think about teaching kids? Well, there's many reasons, of course, to make a difference in the lives of children. It's always a good one. Um, sharing your experience, your knowledge base that you're learning here at UNT, sharing it with the next generation, being a positive role model, um, collaborating with others, because when you are a teacher, you are collaborating with the science teacher, the math teacher, the social studies teacher. You're helping to create uh, the plays and the backdrops, and so you're constantly collaborating with parents and kids and and teachers, so it, it helps to hone your interpersonal skills as well as your communication skills. So that's something to think about as well. Uh, in addition, you encourage cre critical thinking and problem solving. And again, that's something people don't think about in art education classes. So you're not just splashing some paint with kids, you're teaching them how to work through artistic problems, how to ideate. So there's a, a lot more to it. And it's an amazing, I'm gonna keep saying that, it's an amazing choice. Uh, and also it's impacting your community. Because when you think about everybody here watching within the sound of my voice, had a teacher that impacted them in some way and changed their life. Everybody has at least one. Mine was Mrs. Mahar, my second grade teacher. And she gave me a love of poetry. Oh, I remember her to this day. So you just never know who you can, who you can, who, what children are gonna be sitting in front of you. And years later, 
they'll say, oh, Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. So it's just an idea that when you're a teacher, you're also a, a member of a community, a school community, the outer community, and you are making an impact on that whole community with just one child, the next child, the next child. And the last one is an important one, because sometimes when you're an art major, people, people, your family and friends are like, art major? What you gonna do with that? I know people said the same thing to me, I, I, you know. But we know better. We're, we're artists. We know better. But uh, there's something to think about with job stability. Being a K-12 teacher, um, art teacher was always a stable career for me, and I also had an art practice in addition to that. And it's still a stable career even with COVID-19 and even with 2020 being the year of <laughs> of craziness. And it's actually still a very stable career. So, and, and before I get to the salaries, which is an important thing to note, post-graduation possibilities. So you, of course you can teach in a traditional public school ISD. You know, that's always, you know, what the, the, the main thing that people would do with an art education degree. But you can also teach in private schools, again, which is what um, I did for a, a period, a small period of time, Catholic schools, um, public charter academies, which are what most of my teaching was in the city of Detroit. In addition, you can move into art spaces um, and become a museum educator. You can work with community arts organizations, which is what Peter was talking about as well. You can also have your own business where you can teach your own online classes. You've probably seen art teacher websites. Uh, there's one named Cassie Stevens, one called Deep Space Sparkle, where these people are are doing very well and they are certified teachers who have now gone into either the arena of a bit of social media, a bit of sharing their skill through, through digital PDs. You can also teach classes from your own studio. When I had a studio, I used to have other money making things I would do through my own studio. So that's an option as well. Salaries. Now, if you decide to teach, become a certified teacher and work in an ISD, the, these are salaries for first year teachers just coming out of college with just a bachelor's degree, which I think is pretty good, you know. So Fort Worth ISD, 55, Houston, 54,000, Dallas, 56, Frisco, McKinney, they're all about the same kind of starting salary. So that's just something to consider as well. Now, pathways, if you decide to become a certified teacher, because you don't always have to be certified to work in some areas, but if you decide to become a certified teacher, there's different ways to do it. So here at UNT, forgive me, I live near the train. Can't have a Zoom without the train in the background. That's how you know Zoom's going well. <laughs> but um, so you can get a BFA in art education, of course. You can double major. I have many, many students that double major in drawing and painting and ceramics and sculpture and also art education. Also, you can, after graduation, you can come back and get a master's degree that certifies you at the same time. And here at UNT, it's called um, Track 3. At some other schools, it's called an MAT, which is a Master of Arts in Teaching. But our school, it's a Master of Arts in Art Education, Track 3. So that's something to think about as well. Now, another thing is alternative certification. So if you don't wanna go the traditional route, um, you want to graduate first, maybe work in the fields, maybe try different things and then come back to it, there are many different alternative certification programs. So this website here takes you, it's TEA, which is the Texas Education Agency, which is you get certified through TEA. And you can go, you can go on the website and they show you all of the EPPs, which are educator preparation programs that offer, offer alternative certification. And there's many different pathways to do it. Now you can, what I did is I got a post back, which was a year, which is similar to what this is here. So they're saying they're considering that an alternative certification process where usually it takes about a year and you'll receive a one year probationary certificate while you're going through that or after you finish that, either one of those. And another way, they on the website, it'll tell you that you wanna choose an approved alternative certification program. You can also get certified through a school district permit. Sometimes that will be if it's a high need area like math or science or special education, or if the school district is in need of teachers. 
Sometimes they'll certify you through the school. There's also waivers. That is another way if, sorry. That's also if um, a school is in a high need and there's a teacher shortage, they can waive certification processes and push you. So that's sometimes an emergency situation, but that is an alternative way as well. And another one I found that was really interesting was called the Dallas Teacher Residency. It's through Texas A&M and it's your long apprenticeship. And you actually get paid during this apprenticeship and you get a master's degree at the end of it. Now, this is another one that is more geared towards what they will consider core subjects, which I have an issue with because art should be a core subject, but we're not a tested subject. Uh, it's in the STAR test. But through this program, the students who get chosen are put in, again, what are called urban schools, which we know that that can sometimes have a negative connotation, but it should not. It should not because Dallas is an urban district and many of you may be from Dallas, Fort Worth, will be considered an urban district. And just because it has that label does not mean it's something to shy away from. So oftentimes there will be more positions available in what will be labeled urban districts. So the Dallas teacher residency is another uh, method to get certified in Dallas. Now I did see some humanities teachers on the website, but I didn't see art, but you never know. That's just something to consider. Another good option, if you want to work with K-12 populations, but you don't necessarily want to be a certified teacher and work full time in schools, is you can work in after school programs, you can work in artists in schools program, which is something that Benoit has did when he was a student. And there's some examples that I found here in Texas were the Young Audiences of Houston, and Young Audiences of Houston works with theater, dance, visual art, all different types of arts. And they bring professional artists like you will be, and they, put, they place you in schools and you work with kids. Another one is called Artbound, which is out of the Art League of Houston, which is a smaller um, art space. They have a program of community outreach where they send artists out to the schools, and they also bring students into the, to the um, space. And the last one is one I found in Central Texas called Creative Action. And that was also the arts, a mix of different types of art going out into the schools and bringing kids to different programs. So that's another thing you might consider is working in more of a community capacity or working as more of a kind of an artist in residence in a way, because some of the programs were listed that way if you're working there for a long period of time. It just depends, but that's something to consider. Now, career trajectory, career trajectory. Now, because you say, well, I'm an art teacher, so this is all that I can be, but that's not true. That's not true because you can move up in different leadership positions within your school, within your district, within your region. Within your school, you can become a lead teacher. Within your district, you can work with TAEA. That's what that would be region. I'm sorry, going to your region would be TAEA, which is Texas Art Education Association, which is broken into regions. And you can become a district lead as far as the base competition. You can become a district lead to help with curriculum. There are all types of different leadership positions. Within your district, within your ISD, you can move up to be a lead teacher that helps run PDs, that helps to uh, write curriculum, because here in Denton ISD and other areas, the teachers are helping to write the curriculum. So you can be chosen as one of those lead teachers. And this is from our wonderful UNT website. So the, the art education, the field of art education encompasses so many different things because you're learning ceramics, you're learning painting, you're learning, you're learning sculpture, and then you're applying those things to aesthetics and art appreciation, art history, creativity, criticism. So you're learning a multitude of different aspects of the art that you then take and you teach with uh, K-12 populations. Visual culture studies, technology, which we know is a huge thing right now because we're all teaching via Zoom and learning via Zoom. Even before this, even before Corona, the coronavirus, there was a thing called flipped classrooms where it, the teacher would pre-record videos and the kids may have an iPad right in the class and they're watching your videos, teaching themselves how to do something at their own pace. So even before we got to this juncture, technology is an integral part of art education even before now.
and we try to provide a deep understanding of contemporary and visual art forms. Got to plug UNT. <laughs> we love UNT. Um, now, this is just if you if you're thinking more about educa art education, if I've sparked something in you, you know, which is always yeah, let's hope. But there's many types. Type there's paradigms. There's types of of approaches to teaching. So there's one called discipline-based art education, which is the one that you're probably most familiar with and probably most teachers do, and it's been prevalent since the 1980s. And it's where you incorporate art history, art education, uh, art production, uh, aesthetics and criticism into your lesson. So you try to hit on all four of these, these disciplines. The second one says art education, it should say art production, but you guys know what I mean. And uh, visual culture art education, where you're talking to kids about art in the everyday, art in all the things that they see all the time, art in the shopping mall, in the magazines and TV commercials, and you're teaching them to deconstruct the visual world around them, how to read images or what's called visual literacy. And there's a, a project that is done quite often in visual culture art education called culture jamming, where you do subvertisements and you take an, an, an advertisement like um, Starbucks and then you change the logo around it. It's getting kids to think about it in a different type of way, like consumerism. But that's a really interesting approach that I like as well. Um, and issues based art education can also be called social justice art education where you're incorporating the relevant issues of the day. And we know right now there are many, many, many issues. We're in really a triple pandemic. You know, there's a issue of race in America that's come to a boiling, boiling point. There's um, an economic pandemic and then there's a health pandemic. So there's so many things to talk about. And it with this issues-based art education, you're, you're deconstructing the issues that the kids are are surrounded by through art making. And you're giving the kids a chance to have a voice and to talk and to examine these different notions and things that they're dealing with on a regular basis. And then there's one called culturally relevant art education, which comes from Gloria Latson Billings. And it's where you're incorporating the culture of the student population into your teaching, because we know that Historically, the his, our historical canon, of course, is traditionally, you know, white and male. But you're bringing in the cultures of um, students that are Latinx, students that are African American, students that are of the Asian diaspora, and you're including that as an integral part of your lesson, not just like, oh, it's Black History Month, let's throw a little, you know, MLK in there. No, 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 no. You're including who they are as an integral part of what you do. And that's what something that I personally did because I taught mostly in majority minority schools, which was an amazing experience. Uh, and then lastly, just if you're thinking some more, just sparking anything else, you know, these are some of the educational philosophies and educational theories that our art program here at UNT and most art programs and the idea of art education in general are based on some of these theories or these ideas of experiential learning and low and fell stages of development, culturally re relevant pedagogy, which I just mentioned, uh, constructivism, which goes along with scaffolding, multiple intelligences, which we know is huge because not everybody learns pencil and paper, listening to the teacher just drone on and on and on, and that's all that we do. You're hitting multiple intelligences when you're teaching, so you're trying to engage as many students as possible. And lastly, I'm gonna leave up here, this is just our course sequence. In case you're interested in double majoring, you're welcome to come. So if you're, if you're interested in that, this is a sequence of our courses and um, you take them in a cohort and you move with your cohort ideally as you go along, um, you know, foundations, topics, elementary methods, which is something I missed out on because I did a post back. And that just was 20 years ago. It may be different now if you do a, a one year post back, but I missed out on the methods courses. So then there's global aesthetic, there's secondary methods, because many people at UNT, many, many of the students want to go into high school teaching. So you take uh, methods courses in a secondary suite. Uh, then you do student teaching, which is fantastic and you'll love it. You do one half of your student teaching with elementary kids and you do the other half with high school kids. And 
you know, it, it, it'll forever change you. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to need to take state teacher exams. You'll take one for the art content and one called the PPR, which is professional practice. And uh, then there's also three extra courses you take in teacher ed to help to strengthen you as well. And that is it. I will leave it there. But um, again, the pathways are many and the types of school are varied and the types of teaching you can do are varied. So it's not just one thing. It's not just maybe what you you remember it to be. You know, you can bring all of your goodness, all of your expertise, bring it to the table and break it down and deconstruct it and share it with students and you'll love it. The kids will love it. It's just something to consider many different ways to be work with kids in K-12 population. Thank you very much.